Welcome to the Blue Security Podcast, a weekly podcast for information security defenders, where we bring you discussions on best practices, tools, and implementation for enterprise security. Now, here are your hosts for today's show, Andy Ja and Adam Brewer. Welcome to the Blue Security Podcast. I'm Andy, your host. And I'm Adam, your co-host. This week, we have Matthew Ward and Matt Benio joining us to talk about Mac management. Matt, if you want to give a quick introduction uh, for what your background, what you've been up to, where you work currently, and where our listeners can find you if uh, they need to have additional questions following the show. And then, Matthew, you go ahead and follow after that. Sounds great. I'm Matt Benio. Uh, I currently work at Jamf. I am a sales engineer there. And my background is I've been in technical sales for about six years between Jamf and Apple. And I've got kind of a hodgepodge background. I have a theater education and just been an Apple nerd my whole life. So just finding that, you know, personally for me, it's that uh, crossroads of the liberal arts and uh, technology, trying to kind of live in that space. And you know, make uh, make things come off as more human. Uh, so give that polish to the nerdy stuff. So that's what I've been doing. Um, I not a big social media guy, but I'm Matt Benio on Twitter and Open Eye Visuals on Instagram. Awesome, awesome. Uh, my name is Matthew Ward. Uh, I started my career in tech with Apple. Uh, over the uh, next decade, I worked in the Fortune 500 and K-12 in higher ed uh, as an operational IT engineer focused on Apple device management specifically. Uh, I currently work with uh, Jamf's U.S. federal government customers, helping them find success with Apple. Um, not really big on the social media, but you can find me on LinkedIn for sure. Um, yeah, great to be here. Thanks for having us. Thanks for being here, guys. The reason why we're here is because Adam and I, we've encountered Max in our previous organizations. We use Max in our personal life. And oftentimes, we find at many companies, Max will come up as a topic that is difficult for IT to manage. So if you're in an organization and maybe you don't have any Max, and that executive or that marketing person or that designer says, hey, Max work for me, I like to use Max, or maybe you have a few Macs and it starts to get more and more difficult to manage. You're gonna ask yourself questions like, how do I get this person on the corporate Wi-Fi? How do I get them access to printers? How do I deploy applications? They're a local administrator on that Mac now, and." How do I get them to sign in with some sort of managed identity, right? Active directory, perhaps, or something else. So those questions creep up, and certainly they can be difficult to answer for anyone who has ever tried to manage a Mac in an enterprise environment. So we're bringing you guys on to try to answer those questions so when you talk to organizations about this topic, I mean, where do you start and how do you, how do you advise them to begin the difficult task mm -hmm. of managing Max? Yeah, it's a good point because uh, I think we, we start, or I like to start from a place of, of empathy, honestly, because a lot of the people we talk to are not necessarily Apple people, you know, a lot of admins are used to the Windows world. The way I think about it is, if given the choice, IT often goes with Windows because Windows was really designed to be that kind of a platform to be managed, and that was kind of from its inception. Whereas Apple, uh, on the other hand, was really designed for that consumer user experience. We're at the point now where you know these businesses essentially have to offer that as a, a competitive advantage. If you don't offer employee choice, you could literally lose um, you could lose new employees off of that type of thing. So when you know when you get that patient zero in marketing or executive that just has to have it their way, you have to find some way to basically get the same types of security controls 
and ways to deliver resources to the end users that are then uh, using Apple and having their way that isn't going to cause friction, isn't going to then also destroy that user experience that the user was begging for in the first place. So that's really where everything starts and what happens and what's been the uh, the paradigm, at least, you know, until fairly recently, is that you try to take the things that work in Windows and you try to bolt them on to what's going on in Mac. It's, it's kind of an obvious first step. But obviously that has a whole uh, bag of problems in itself. Apple is updating its platform constantly and uh, really these solutions weren't designed for that sort of thing. So what we try to do is get organizations to recognize what was really that target experience underneath uh, that solution that Windows had. Having a way to have a user securely access their machine and know that they're part of your organization, know that they're securely accessing their resources, know that they're getting Wi-Fi in a way that they don't have to interrupt your lunch break. All those things we can accomplish in ways that are more native to Mac OS and iOS without having to necessarily try and rely on these other solutions. And Apple has come a very long way in um, making their platform ready for these types of solutions and Jamf has become obviously like a leader in this space of providing this exact type of solution. So um, that's where we kind of wanted to start is talk about how the main solutions that are out there, obviously we know Jamf the best, start to map these different original goals like identity management um, and resource delivery in an Apple first type of way. And we thought we might as well start with uh, the identity piece of how this all fits together on the Apple side. Well, as a identity seller at Microsoft, I love starting with identity. We often talk about identity as the new control plane. It's the new security battleground where once you have your identity in place, kind of everything else follows. So I think that's a great place to start. But before we do, I wanted to back up just a step. First off, I love, I love the fact that you led with empathy because Andy and I talk about that a lot on this show. And I'd like to think we're one of the first security podcasts to, to make that a point throughout is having empathy for our users, having empathy for our fellow security practitioners and understanding to your point that some of the people you talk to in, in your work life they might not have that experience and background you have. So how can you bring them along the journey? You know, I really appreciate that. And then kind of the last point, you were talking about how Apple has really grown up in the enterprise space and, and it's not kind of what it once was. And a, a particular thing I noticed here at Microsoft where we're trying to get our customers to modernize their Windows management practices is how much the Apple paradigm that they invented with MDM protocol all the way back in iOS 4 has kind of, invaded the industry and has become kind of the new way of doing things. Windows 10 now has a model that's very similar where you have MDM APIs you can call to manage the OS. It's agentless. It's built in at the operating system level. Things like autopilot, they're all analogous to some of the stuff that Apple really piloted and, and created first. And so that's interesting that you made the point that, you know, traditionally it was seen as Windows was built for the enterprise, but Windows has been borrowing a lot of ideas from Apple lately. And so I think this is interesting to learn from an organization that, despite some of the dismissiveness of some people in enterprise IT, should get the credit for coming up with some new paradigms for how we manage devices. So yeah, let's start with identity. Tell us about identity on the Mac platform and some of the different nuances compared to you know how people traditionally think about that on Windows where there's a relationship between the identity on device and a directory. What's different on the Mac? What should people know? Yeah, those are some really great points, Adam. Um, I, you know, going, just speaking to uh, the, the kind of the flipped roles there a little bit, I, I also kind of find it ironic that uh, some, uh, some of the Windows-centric uh, organizations uh, are currently still struggling with trying to manage their Apple devices in that Windows-centric model when uh, if they were switched around and actually focused on uh, you know, deploying it the same way that they could approach Windows now, it actually would have that, that very close uh, analogous. Um, so, you know, speaking specifically to, uh, to identity, you know, one of the, one of the big, um, you know, pieces of, of Mac OS is the idea of, of binding your Mac to an Active Directory server that uh, is going to traditionally give you resource access, or I'm sorry, access to resources on the enterprise. Um, uh, but that's kind of the, the, the first place that starts to become an issue uh, with modern device management is the idea of mobile accounts, or I'm sorry, network accounts versus local accounts on the Mac. And there's this traditional uh, 
mentality uh, a little bit in the in the Windows centric IT world that uh, you know when you bind your computer to the domain that's how you get the fullest control over that computer and that's that's how you you know kind of keep tabs on on your organization and provide uh, 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 management capabilities, but unfortunately, that couldn't be farther from the truth for Mac OS, and it's and it's always kind of been that way. You know, it's certainly true that there's benefits of binding your Mac, uh, but nowadays, uh, not only is there uh, other ways to achieve those benefits in much more seamless ways, the um, uh, downsides uh, don't need to be there that that exist with binding. So for for local accounts. Uh, that's Apple's recommendation is to use a local account. So why don't we want to bind to Active Directory? Um, the, the the main reasons for that is, like I was saying, it's 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 unnecessary because that you can augment those benefits. Uh, and then, like I said, we'll get to them a little bit more of that later. And, and that AD does not equal any type of management. In fact, when you bind a Mac to an Active Directory domain, it's a one-way relationship. Um, I always uh, kind of would show our network admins in some of my previous roles. You know, if you look at the actual computer record in Active Directory, it still will have the original OS that the computer was bound with. You know, so if it was on 10.9 and it's now on 10.13, you don't even know that in Active Directory. Um, yeah, there's still that trust relationship uh, that needs to be maintained, but there's no actual like, flow of information back and forth between the computer uh, and, and the uh, directory. So the, the idea that you know, there's any kind of actual management is just you know, kind of false. So, so what do you gain from Active Directory? So traditionally, you, you know, you've got your Kerberos uh, server that can let you access resources like SMB shares and pr SMB printers. Uh, being able to deliver certificates for uh, 802.1x uh, Wi-Fi authentication. Um, the the recommendation from Apple is to use local accounts, like I mentioned. Uh, in fact, there's a there's a great uh, developer session at, during WWC where they they speak to that, and we'll put that in the show notes exactly like when they, when they mention that. This was the experience when I first encountered Max in an enterprise at my previous uh, one of my previous companies. We bound our max to ad mm -hmm. and we got we had to manually install those certificates to authenticate the wi-fi mm. and if anyone has ever had any experience with that you also log in with your active directory identities and anytime you change your password there's going to be keychain errors i mean mm -hmm. anyone who has managed max in an enterprise who binds their max to ad mm -hmm. you understand the pain that you go through with those keychain errors mm -hmm. and so I think back to the episode that we did with Shannon Fritz about device identity and device management. And they're actually two different things. Where the device lives has really no impact on how it's actually managed sometimes. Like in this case, if you're binding the Mac to AD, the device identity lives within Active Directory, but it doesn't have any true management capabilities, right? You're not able to set any configurations through AD. Like mm -hmm. I can't set the firewall. I can't set the file vault. I can't mm -hmm. store any of that information. Like you said, Ward, the information doesn't even flow back if they're on different operating systems. And so I think that's probably one of the biggest downfalls when it comes to these things. Yes, you mm -hmm. get, you gain some file shares and maybe you can log in with your active directory identity for a little bit until you have to change your password again mm -hmm. but it's it's painful right mm -hmm. for it to manage it's painful for the users mm -hmm. they're, absolutely they're po co constantly getting popped up with these errors and whatnot every time you rotate something and mm -hmm. um, i think there's probably a better way a more modern way to do things to adam's point Apple has come a long way and mm -hmm. you know there's this this whole different way of managing it so mm -hmm. yeah absolutely those are those are great points the um, you know and going back to the the the, you know, the, the core reason why that even happens is because that network uh, domain controller doesn't have with the security model of how macOS works with file vault at the EFI level, there is no actual ability within the security stack of macOS for it to change that file vault password. So you get into a situation where those, those passwords become out of sync for the local user versus their file vault password. And like you said, it's such a burden on IT uh, help desk uh, staff and, and just the cost that can incur and the user frustration. Uh, it, it can become quite frankly a nightmare. Uh, um, so much to, in fact, um, I can speak from experience a bit from my last role uh, at the University of Wisconsin. Um, you know, so all of our Macs were bound to Active Directory. 
um, using mobile accounts. And uh, UW System actually implemented a password policy uh, against some of our better judgment for password rotation. Um, and but we had to comply with that, right? So right away, speaking to the, the, the reasons that you just mentioned, knowing that was gonna be a huge issue, um, we started looking at ways we could circumvent that process, still get the benefits that the users and, and researchers and staff were used to, 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 to accessing. And that landed us on, uh, at that time, a tool called Nomad, which was a, an open source project uh, that was put together by uh, a couple uh, of former Apple employees that uh, was all about removing the bind, but still being able to deliver some of those, uh, not even some of, all of the functions that are the benefits that you did get in macOS. So uh, you can still provision that account using the LDAP or Active Directory credentials. Uh, when that user logs in, they get a Kerberos ticket, uh, and you can maintain uh, that Kerberos ticket and have it renew itself, which is actually another big problem in the enterprise. As you know, there's a 12-hour window on that on that ticket for Kerberos. And in macOS, when you shut the lid to your laptop, which everyone's doing nowadays, you don't log out or shut your computer down. You just shut the lid and move move to your nearest uh, meeting. Uh, back when we were lucky enough to be able to do that, um, but what what once they open their lid, there's no Kerberos ticket. So they go to you know go about their work and things don't automatically connect. And designers get upset because their file shares aren't mess are are uh, messed up. And their Adobe files that they shouldn't have been saving on the network anyway are now messed up because of that. And it just causes a usability nightmare. Um, so Nomad came around to kind of get rid of that bind, but still give those functionalities. Um, and now Nomad still exists, and it still definitely has a use case. Uh, if you still are in a very on-premise uh, AD situation uh, and you haven't moved to any kind of a cloud IDP. Nomad is a tool that can can give you all of those features. But Apple's actually built in uh, through their new uh, SSO extension functionality. Um, there is built in Kerberos ticket delivering uh, password cycling uh, of that of that account password and and in my realm this is very important there's there's even pknet uh, smart card support built into that SO, SSO extension so right from Apple again kind of going back to that that the theme a little bit they're providing those enterprise tools that you can use right out of the box and you just use that with a, a modern management uh, tool uh, uh, through MDM and deliver that to your devices and uh, the users can uh, even in uh, kind of that more on-premise environment can still have a, a fairly modern experience so you just said a lot there. <laughs> I, I just wanted to unpack this a little bit, make sure I'm understanding it, understanding it correctly for our, our listeners as well. Um, you guys kind of talked through that initially in the beginning, you know, in the beginning, uh, people bound their Macs to AD and it was not good. Um, it sounds like it was very fragile. It was a poor user experience, especially with password rotation and uh, all sorts of stuff. And it really didn't deliver a ton of benefits. So the, the benefit kind of drawback ratio was very skewed in the wrong direction. And so this thing came, Nomad came along, which I believe stands for no more AD, right? And it kind of solved Just some of those of problems. With... Oh, okay. Do tell. Well, I, I mean, there's AD is in the mix, so, you know. <laughs> sure. Oh, I think I, that I was one of those saying. names kind of given to it after the fact is what yeah, yeah. they were getting uh, at. But yes, it does fit very nicely. As, yes. as they say, a, a backronym, <laughs> right? Yes. Yes, yes. Okay. So, so Nomad came along and it, and it solves some of those pain points by instead of creating that bind, um, instead kind of managing that identity and managing particularly Kerberos tickets is really kind of, it sounds like one of its major capabilities, giving you that single sign on experience to locally protected windows shares, like SMB printers, SMB file shares, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then you mentioned there's this Mac OS single sign on extension. So, and that's a newer thing. Can that replace the use of Nomad today? Yes, it absolutely can. Um, there's definitely some okay. features in Nomad that give you more uh, abilities um, that the single sign-on extension can't uh, offer. One of those would be local or multiple user support. So, um, just like with Active Directory, uh, you know, let's let's go back, you know, ten or fifteen years. You sit down at a computer lab or a shared machine, and any user can sit down and authenticate and and create their account and log in. You know, you don't have to be pre-provisioned. Uh, Nomad gives that kind of of an opportunity as well, so uh, that you. Can can, you know could have a, a shared environment uh, in that situation where you couldn't do something like that there's some other uh, smaller use cases but um, you know Apple, Apple uh, 
actually got rid of their competing product that they used to sell to the enterprise called Enterprise Connect. Uh, that was kind of a direct competitor to Nomad, and they kind of folded their, their hands on that and realized that it was just better to just kind of integrate that into the system, which is what they did with macOS Catalina uh, going forward, and then added the SSO extension, uh, which is, again, going back to this theme of Apple listening to the enterprise users and what their needs are and, and actually pivoting and changing how they approach things. So uh, good, great to see and that SSO that, extension has to be delivered through an MDM solution, correct? That's correct. Yep, absolutely. Okay. So <laughs> I was just going to say, we, we've kind of established our villain here, right? We've kind of established what not to do. So can one of you guys kind of walk us through like, okay, so we're starting with identity. We've got some Macs. Where do we start? Like as far as provisioning, you said we want local accounts. That's Apple's guidance. So where do we start with that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and also to tie back, I mean, like, it, it, when we're looking at, like, when you try to force these other paradigms in, that's where you create this, like, emotional tension between IT staff and the end users. They both kind of hate each other over it because, you know, neither goals are really being represented. And so it is nice to see that Apple starting to naturally, natively evolve these fixes and solutions into the platform. So one of these like native solutions that have come in is built into the automated device enrollment experience. And we'll get into maybe a little bit of the pieces that are required to make that work. In Windows, this has kind of been borrowed as I understand it. It was kind of the, the essentially a copy of this idea with autopilot. But what we're able to do in the automated uh, device enrollment space with an MDM solution like Jamf is to actually use a cloud identity provider. So that, I mean, this is the other thing too, is like binding, not only is that forcing it onto you know, the, the uh, Mac OS platform from Windows, but even that on-premises type of setup, that is also going the way of the dinosaur and is especially accelerated by the fact that none of us are you know, in an office anymore. So, uh, and now that everyone has things like Azure AD, Okta is very popular as well. Um, what Apple has made available is the ability to tie in that cloud identity provider as part of that onboarding experience. So you can uh, literally gate almost as a security protocol when that person opens up a Macintosh, they connect to the network, Apple recognizes that serial number as owned by the organization and it goes and retrieves configurations from Jamf or whoever the MDM server is. And part of that configuration can be authenticating the user from the cloud. So if it's Azure, um, what we can do then is the user authenticates with their provided credentials and then we're actually able to then grab uh, those credentials and actually put those in as the local account credentials. So to really kind of eliminate any possibility that someone's going to be a wiseacre and, you know, name themselves Michael Scott or whatever the case is on my, you know, my demo that I do, um, we can really make sure that we're doing that right out of the box, uh, which is fantastic. Obviously, that's a huge head start, but you know, there are still limitations um, of that. Things that kind of come to mind for me are like, obviously once that account gets created, there's no mechanism there to make sure that I'm not gonna go and then up, suddenly update my password in system preferences and now suddenly I'm back out of sync with what the cloud credentials are. Or uh, on the other hand, maybe I go and I update my cloud credentials that expired in two weeks. There's nothing necessarily making sure that those local credentials get updated to that cloud uh, credential as well. Uh, some organizations want to get really aggressive with their security protocols. Maybe they want multi-factor authentication. None of that stuff's quite available yet. So it's still pretty in its infancy for the native stuff. But obviously I'm setting myself up like we have ways that you can also augment these capabilities that are there with some of our um, Jamf solutions as well. Yeah, so if I'm hearing you right, just kind of summarizing the provisioning part of it through automated de device and uh, deployment, like Apple Business Manager, mm -hmm. right? You can get all those benefits and link up with your cloud identity and pull those credentials down and provision it using an MDM solution like Jamf to create that local user and sync those credentials as the local user on that machine once the user gets the machine for the first time. 
Yeah, essentially. It's, it's kind of a two for one in the sense that you're both authenticating that the person who's, you know, connecting this computer didn't just steal it off of a porch and isn't suddenly, you know, getting Adobe and all of your other work resources delivered via MDM. But once you have authenticated and that person, you know, authenticates who they are, then automatically Apple is then creating that local account based on those credentials. Right. And then there's no way in that scenario when you're first setting up, if you don't have any other tool sets, it doesn't sync back anytime those credentials change. You're not getting any of those other benefits like MFA. So what if I want that as a security professional? What if I want MFA for when the user logs in or I obviously for user experience, I want those credentials to update when they're updated in my IDP, right? So how does that work? Yeah, so uh, we have Enter, another fantastic Jamf product that builds on what Apple natively has and augments it a bit, is there's this idea of Jamf Connect. And just as the quick history, uh, Jamf Connect originally was Nomad, and we acquired that uh, intellectual property and those people who developed that, and that still exists as open source, but Jamf Connect is the same idea, but then adapted to these new cloud identity providers. So with that, Part of that enrollment when you know Apple Business Manager determines that this thing is owned by your organization, part of your Jamf configuration would be install the Jamf Connect application as an enrollment package, literally as one of the first orders of business. And then what it's able to do then is it actually skips the native account creation process and suddenly you're staring at the Jamf Connect user interface, which maybe you're looking at a you know an Azure AD window. So you again are authenticating against Azure AD. Same idea, we're creating that local account. But once you have Jamf Connect in place, a secondary part of Jamf Connect is there's a a menu bar application or essentially an agent that's checking in every 15 minutes to make sure that that local account matches what the cloud identity provider is. And if those get out of sync, it forces the user to remediate. So uh, it's nice because you don't have to do something wonky that Apple is already you know, signaling a yellow light on like mobile accounts. We're still able to use a local account, but we're having this nice overlay that makes sure that you're still logging in with something that's reasonably up to date with your cloud identity provider. So that same idea where it's like, focus on the end goal, get there in a way that doesn't break the Apple experience. I'm just curious. I'm just curious. Does Jamf Connects kind of stand on its own? I know that obviously there's a Jamf uh, Pro, which is your... MDM solution, but what if I'm using a different MDM solution like Intune or uh, Mass360? I mean, yeah. can I still Great. get that experience? Great question. Yeah, it, it is MDM agnostic. Uh, you get some extra benefits, uh, types of reporting and things that we can create smart groups on within Jamp Pro. But if you're using, you know, any of our, uh, you know, those that we, I won't personally mention on this podcast. Uh, <laughs> Uh, yeah, it, it totally works. You could even install it locally without any MDM whatsoever. Um, it's just a very simple, it's a package and some configuration profiles that then tie to whatever your tenant is, whether it's Okta, Azure, One Login. Really, anyone who supports the OpenID uh, Connect specifications, we're able to work with. So it's cool. Like I've set up, um, you know, first time, like we've never used this IDP, but as long as we know that they have all of the OpenID Connect um, pieces that we need, we are reasonably confident that it works and it does. You know, back when we had, oh, I was just gonna make a quick point here um, before you go into more, Matthew. Um, again, Microsoft guy here. So, so one of the things I enjoy is that as much as people like to pretend like the Microsoft Apple's, you know, cold war is still in effect. Um, it's interesting to note back when we still had in-person conferences. When you had the Jamf Nation conference a couple of years ago, Brad Anderson, who was at the time corporate vice president at Microsoft in terms of our endpoint management stuff, was on stage demonstrating Jamf Connect and how great it worked with Absolutely. Azure AD and he could use password lists mm -hmm. and all this great stuff. And um, it's 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 a it's a great product, but also, you know, even works great with Azure AD and Microsoft stuff and whatever. You know, it's it's um, uh, really interesting the the partnership that that our organizations have had together too, and and the stuff we've been able to do together. 
Mm-hmm. And, you know, Adam, you actually, that was a very close to, uh, or, or a great segue into what I was actually going to bring up, is that the, the, the other, the, the benefits that Jamf Connects bring in a, in a more secure environment um, that might be using something like Azure's uh, conditional access uh, that has, you know, we've got many great integrations in Jamf Pro and, and in with uh, Jamf Connect, um, but one thing that Jamf Connect adds over the traditional, you know, Mac OS base offerings is, you know, say you do want to force, uh, force network authentication at every login. Uh, so that there is no possibility of, a, of an unauthorized user to be able to access that machine. Uh, that's a possibility with Jamf Connect. Uh, if you do want to have MFA policies uh, that and, and enforce that at the login, uh, that's definitely a, a great feature to, to, for Jamf Connect login. Um, going to the conditional access piece of that, uh, you, you can start to use that that mentality of, of you know you've got a, an authorized trusted user that is going to be accessing your resources and your machine, and you've got an uh, managed and secured uh, Mac that is either managed in a uh, tool like Jamf Pro or, or Intune or, or what have you. And you can very, very nicely kind of tie that whole uh, access experience together uh, to ensure that at all times their that your users are uh, properly provisioned. Um, one of my favorite features is you can have very specific user groups for controlling access to the machine, uh, I'm sorry, the, the local account level. So are they gonna be a standard account or are they gonna be an administrator account? And that can dynamically change at every single login as the administrators change that in Azure. So if instantly you want to let a group be an admin because they've got some special projects that they're working on for that week, you can change that uh, in Azure, in, you know, ha- and once they log out, log back in, now they're an admin. Uh, and then, or say, you know, you, you have a, an employee that uh, needs to have, uh, a, you know, a walkout event or something like that, you can cut access in Azure to all of the resources across the entire enterprise, not just to Jam for to their Mac, but we're talking the entire suite, right? Uh, and instantly, you you know that they can't access any of your uh, systems, they can't access their computer, uh, and that can all happen at the push of a button in Azure. So, um, really, really great tie-ins there for the enterprise. And that is why identity is the control plane, right there. Absolutely, perfect example. And so I, I like Jamf Connect just as a standalone product because it really solves right away that main issue of the user experience, right? Like I remember when I was at the help desk and I'd get people coming in with Macs and these are usually your executives. Like they're the, you're, they're your VPs, the CEO of the company at my uh, was using a Mac and they they were like, well, I'm getting this keychain issue and it's popping up, and I'm using like two passwords back, and but I'm logging in using the current password and stuff like that, or um, a hodgepodge of different ones they'd have to remember. And with just Jamf Connect, just standalone, you can get rid of that whole thing and have it sync with a cloud identity. You bring up a really great point there that we haven't touched on is that the one of the key functions of Jamf Connect and Nomad for, the, for that matter, if you are still on premise, uh, is that uh, I mentioned how Active Directory does not have the, the proper authentication authority to change the file vault password. Um, that's simply not the case with Jamf Connect and Nomad because it's built into the authorization uh, system of Mac OS, very natively hooked right into the system. Uh, so when you change that password, whether it's externally off the machine, you know, maybe an IT staff has to reset your password or you change it on another computer like a Windows machine when you get to your Mac instantly Jamf Connect or Nomad in that case will pick up that password change and prompt the user to to change their password but in doing so um, there's actually three instances of that password in Mac OS. There's your login password that you type to log in, there's the login keychain password, uh, and then there's the file vault password. Now all three of those passwords should match and be the same password uh, in, an, in a functional state. Uh, but what happens, like we've talked about, is they get out of sync and, and it causes a, a, a nightmare. Uh, but Jamf Connect and Nomad specifically uh, are able to change all three of those passwords every time that password cycles. And the end user experience, which is always the end goal, is so seamless that they don't even realize that any things really happening and that's that's the that's the always the goal so that's uh, the nightmare right because like if you if you actually start encrypting your Macs, which is what we want to do Mm -hmm. right we want to turn on file Mm -hmm. vault well and all current Macs, you know from three years forward are all encrypted by default uh so right and and if you start doing that and then your passwords get out of sync and then you can't unlock your file vault i mean that's the nightmare 
right? Or you have to destroy so, your login keychain and lose all of your saved credentials and certificates. And it just, it's just a, I mean, coming from an IT operational support for the last decade, I, I wish I had a dollar for every time I heard about these issues we're talking about because I would, I would be, uh, uh, you know, a, a wealthier man. So, <laughs> I, you know, full disclosure, you know, our company right now uses Jamf and I've deployed Jamf at a different company as well. And we also use Jamf Connect. And one of the things that is kind of a quirk, and as you talk about this the, with the different places where your password is stored, when you start up your Mac from a cold boot, if you're using Jamf Connect, that first password that you're entering in is actually unlocking the encryption on the mm -hmm. on the hard drive. That's so correct. that looks yeah. a little bit different. The login screen looks a little, a little bit different. But the password, because of Jamf Connect, syncs seamlessly. Mm -hmm. and, and can then, pass you right into the login experience. If you aren't forcing MFA or network authentication, you can just type that one password at uh, EFI unlock, and then you're now at your desktop. And uh, you don't realize that you just passed through about three levels of security. And it's, it's beautiful. Yeah, it, it's a great experience. And then, you know, if you're locking your computer, you know, just walking away and, and you lock the screen, that Jamf Connect screen can be customized. And it looks a little bit different than the cold boot where you're actually unlocking the file vault. But again, that nice experience of having the same password across the board. When you change your password in the IDP, Jamf Connect picks that up and says, oh, hey, we saw that your password in your IDP does not match the local password that is stored, please update it. And Absolutely. You update it and it's good to go. So yeah, mm -hmm. that has been a great uh, management tool for our uh, service desk. Awesome. It's great to hear. Yeah. One thing I really like is that to maintain this theme of just kind of preserving the Apple user experience, it's, I, I know when we talk about this, one thing that people who are invested in the Apple experience always ask about is things like Touch ID, which is obviously a killer feature. And so what's cool is with Jamf Connect, as long as you're not doing a full logout, so if I'm just locking my screen or closing my laptop to go to the bathroom or wherever, like it doesn't interfere with that unless I'm doing a full logout or restarting my machine so I can still get back in with my fingerprint, which really are the same rules that Touch ID conform to anyway. Hey, when are you guys getting Face ID on the Mac? I know, it's got to be soon. <laughs> well, you'd have to ask Apple that one. I, mean, <laughs> I know, I know. I'm just I'm giving you guys a It's hard funny, time. I was just telling Benio. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I was just telling Benio about um, Windows Hello today, uh, actually, as we were kind of working on uh, some of these notes. So, um, yeah, I, I, I think Windows Hello is excellent technology, and uh, I hope that that kind of uh, thing, you know, that's kind of the beauty about Microsoft and Apple uh, over the last, let's say, 10 years is, for, like you said, Adam, you know, that, that love-hate, uh, war uh, is really not there anymore. In fact, um, um, I you know I, I know for for that Jamf is uh, used heavily inside of Microsoft, and I can tell you very very clearly that Microsoft is used extremely heavily inside of Jamf. So um, you know, uh, for for one to 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 win, the other doesn't have to lose. So the, the Cold War is long since over. I I I'm using my Mac as a daily driver at Microsoft. So. Day to day, right now, I come and sit on my Mac. I use Teams. I use Outlook. Mm -hmm. I use Edge browser, so I can mm -hmm. be like all Microsoft software, but running on the Mac. Mm -hmm. And then I can iMessage people during the workday, which is super nice. And so, I'll tell you what, yeah. that's a heck of a statement coming from an award-winning Microsoft solution <laughs> seller. <laughs> it's, that's that's right. which is awesome. I love it. You it's got great. It. World yep. peace that's is cool. possible. It, it is. So we, we got to keep moving the conversation here. So we, we talked a lot about identity, which again, I love because identity is so foundational, but we've got a, a rest of an operating system here to manage guys. So a Mac shows up in our, in our organization and we've got some things we need to do before we can start handing it to people and saying, you can go be productive now. And we don't need a ton, right? Sometimes I think people way blow this out of proportion proportion, I like to call it the minimum viable product. Like when do we have enough to ship? So to use an analogy, look at the original iPhone. The original iPhone didn't have cut, copy, paste. It didn't have third-party apps. There's a ton of stuff it didn't have. It didn't have multitasking, but what it had was, you know, revolutionary user interface, a widescreen iPod with touch controls, and a breakthrough web browser, mobile web browser, right? Internet, and that internet an communicator. I know, I know, but people might not get the, the jobs reference there. But in, in all seriousness, like everyone complained about all it didn't do, but it did enough to be worthwhile to ship. And so I'm like taking that concept and applying it to device management. And Andy, when we had Shannon Fritz on a couple of weeks ago, he said the same thing. 
for modern Windows management was you don't need everything to get started. You just need a couple of things. So we're, we're going to manage a Mac. We want to get Wi-Fi. We want to get maybe any other certs we need. We want to get the minimum set of apps we need to get running. We want to have our identity squared away. We want to have basic security configuration. Okay, how do we do that? Yeah, that is Matt, a Matthew? excellent. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, that is an a- absolutely excellent question um, because qu- all too often, especially when you're unknown uh, to to this kind of a this, this sphere of, of managing devices, you, you a lot of, a lot of IT admins have the uh, tendency to try to configure all the things and and do everything that's possible and and try to you know layer all of this complexity uh, and and sometimes that that can produce the uh, the wrong results. So. Um, I would start, uh, you know, very high performance or importance. And we mention this, um, I would say, probably daily on our calls with our uh, uh, prospective customers or customers, uh, is that if you are going to be serious about managing an Apple device in any kind of business, enterprise, educational environment, you know, essentially where you, you own the devices and you've got users who are using them, I don't care if you've got 10 users or if you've got 10,000. Um, you start with Apple Business Manager, and Apple Business Manager is a free program that Apple uh, facilitates that's really quite simple at its core. Uh, the main point of Apple Business Manager is to provide a known chain of ownership for that device for its entire life cycle. Um, that's the, the main core benefit, uh, is that you purchase that device through either Apple directly or through a reseller, you know, CW Insight, whoever it may be, and when that pr- purchase happens, uh, and this is the same for iOS devices, just to be clear, uh, that gets put into your Apple Business Manager instance, and then from there, you tie that to your MDM solution, uh, like Jamf Pro or Intune, through a token. And instantly, uh, by setting up the configurations ahead of time in in, uh, your MDM solution, the out-of-box experience for the user looks something that is extremely native and just works. And, you know, not to be cliche, but it's as simple as unboxing that Mac from the shrink wrap, booting it up, and joining it to the network in some way. Um, So if you're at home or you're at your... uh, 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 you know, shared co-location co- spot, you're probably just going to have regular WPA2 Wi-Fi, uh, maybe you've got Ethernet, and as soon as that hits Apple servers, it sees it's a part of your organization, talks to your MDM server, delivers those configuration instructions down to the machine, and now starts enrolling into your MDM solution. And what I just described happens in about three seconds flat. And, uh, you know, you can have, you can control what the user sees at that uh enrollment portion and they can be at their desktop using their uh, computer and most importantly getting to work with minimal effort minutes Um, so starting with Apple Business Manager uh, with an MDM solution is definitely uh, crucial from there, um, there's really just a few things like you mentioned is, that's minimum vile product. You've got joining Wi-Fi, so if it's if it's as simple as you know you don't if you just have uh, regular WPA uh, networks, you know they don't you don't really need to manage that. Your users just can connect with the password if it's a pre-shared key, but you could deliver that pre-shared key from an MDM solution. Uh, but more standard if you're on an, on a network, uh, you know. It, at an actual end, you know, business, um, they're going to have some type of an 802.1x enterprise level network where there's a radius server going back to the on-premise uh, Active Directory that probably is still in the mix somewhere. Um, and so you can just deploy that network out with some basic trust settings and l- allow your user to uh, just type their username and password and authenticate. And that's very standard and happens uh, very frequently. But if you want to take it even further, you can integrate a, a tool like Jamf with uh, your Active Directory uh, internal server to deliver certificates for those users to automatically join your Wi-Fi. So the moment they open, get to the desktop in macOS, they're already on the network, logged in as your user. So if you're using any kind of, uh, uh, you know, you can see on the network through your firewall who's actually making those connections. So it's not just a, a, a transparent connection. And then the, the last piece would be configuration security controls of that machine. Um, so I like to call that configuration state management. Uh, and for our, for our Windows uh, admins or security professionals out there, it's very akin to the idea of group policy in the Windows world where you 
are setting a configuration. You're setting what the settings should be on that Mac, and it's locked in state. Uh, and even if you're an administrator, you can't change those settings. So things like a, a screen timeout, where you want to make sure that the password is going to be asked for within five seconds of the screensaver coming on, or setting the encryption that Andy just talked about. It's very seamless in Mac OS. You can uh, have that turned on automatically. Um, uh, it, with Jamf Connect, you can actually have it be turned on right as they're logging in for the first time. It's really beautiful. Um, and then have that encryption key escrowed very securely back to the MDM server um, where it's viewable by the admin um, and, and kind of in a break in case of emergency situation, you always have that file vault key to get into the machine if you need. So the beautiful thing about that is it stops the, the horribly insecure practice of putting uh, one known IT account on the machine with a known password that uh, likely never gets cycled and is one of the biggest security vectors uh, in most enterprises right now. Um, and you don't need to do that anymore at all. And you shouldn't do that because the systems are built to not need that. So don't do it. <laughs> Simple as that. Yeah. Other security configurations that our team generally talks about, and I'm sure other security teams talk about when it comes to, like, say, data exfiltration, blocking maybe iCloud uh, or AirDrop or something like that. Um, and those are all things that can be said. I have a fun story, too, about this to make it really cut and dry for our listeners when it comes to using Apple Business Manager, why you should use it. It's not only for this, but also if a device becomes lost or stolen or someone takes that device, a contentious employee or whatnot, when that device is reset, and this is the same thing with Autopilot, when it's reset, it goes back and talks to that MDM provider. And guess what? When they sign back in, it push, pulls down all of your configurations again. Mm -hmm. We recently Sorry. had... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we we recently had a person email our desktop support manager from the Ukraine. It was a really nice worded email, and it said, "Hey, I just bought this iPad, and it is owned by your organization, and it has your MDM profile on it. Can you please remove it?" And because we use Apple Business Manager and we use an MDM solution tied to that, we were able to track the serial number. We were able to prove that we purchased it and that at some point we lost it. We knew that we had lost a couple of iPads. Um, unfortunately, we didn't document the ones that we lost, but we knew we lost a couple. And we were also able to prove that we purchased it mm -hmm. because it was in our Apple Business Manager. Mm -hmm. The serial number was there. And it was actually in our MDM solution still too. Mm -hmm. And so... We knew that we owned it, and we don't sell these, so we knew that it was a stolen device. Mm -hmm. And absolutely, you know, we had and, to... and to add to that, it ensured that they weren't able to find any way to access your company's resources because of that. It stopped them dead in their tracks. So it's Correct. got a multifaceted yeah. approach. The one, and just real quickly, the one thing I, I also wanted to mention about that kind of minimum viable product uh, is, you know, and the last piece of very clear importance is some uh, application deployment. So that's another function of Apple Business Manager uh, where you want to deploy something like Microsoft Office to your endpoints um, or any, any application that's in the iOS or Mac App Store. You can grab licenses for your users and then deliver those Apple uh, uh, App Store apps directly to the user with no Apple ID required, none of that uh, song and dance. They just get installed directly and automatically kept up to date by the system uh, when Whenever there's an update pushed to the App Store, um, but a, a, on top of that, there's also the possibility for third-party package installation uh, for, for apps uh, that are more enterprise-focused, potentially that aren't in the App Store, like your um, Microsoft Edge or um, uh, you know VPN software, things like that. So one of the things when we were pre-calling this whole podcast was we started talking about security on Macs and. I'm actually pretty interested to hear about how you guys recommend to potential Mac users and, and customers how to actually deploy and protect from an endpoint security uh, standpoint these Macs in their enterprise. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, kind of keeping on theme with everything we've been talking about. Uh, it, it's that same thing where there are plenty of Windows-centric ways that we can try and map existing solutions onto the macOS platform, but increasingly that those types of solutions are having the same types of headaches that we've been addressing this whole time. So uh, not to name names or anything like that, but a lot of these existing, you know, <laughs> if I'm being rude, legacy type providers uh, that are 
offering cross-platform macOS security solutions end up in situations where they start competing with a lot of the native security uh, pieces that are on the Mac. And so you end up having the situation where, you know, maybe Apple has already boosted the security natively of the operating system, but you're not entitled to those features because ironically your security platform is holding you back because they haven't figured out how to, again, uh, port over their solution to the latest version of Mac OS or an M1 chip and all those types of things. And so the types of things that are natively part of Mac OS that you're missing out on or not necessarily being up to date with are things like X protect. So like that's, you've got native malware signature based detection that's part of the operating system. There's the malware removal tool as part of that. So there's actually even things like system scans that are going on um, natively in the operating system where it's like you don't necessarily need an additional solution that's doing those types of things and a lot of those things have been relying on things like kernel extensions. And so again, uh, you know, Apple has made it very clear that they're trying to shut that stuff down. They're not, you know, looking to have kernel extensions because that in itself, as they see it, is in itself a, a security vulnerability. It's going to cause system instability, things like that. Um, is this, are you guys pretty familiar with the native uh, security features that are part of Mac OS? Obviously stuff like the T2 chip, you know, file vault, um, secure boot, that kind of stuff. I think you should still walk through it at a high level. Um, sure. You know, just just assume our audience doesn't know. I mean, like we talked about File Vault throughout the conversation. File Vault equals BitLocker. You know, like stuff yes. like that. So you know, give us that, those sort of things. If you know, just for somebody who's not aware. I mean, Andy and I, I think, are, but. I mean, we mentioned we're, we're daily driving Macs. Yeah. So, so to us, it's not this moon platform, but I think to some of our listeners, it is still a thing they, they have really kept at arm's length. So it's a good review of what some of this stuff is. Yeah. Uh, and so one thing I like to point out with Apple is is it has this reputation. Obviously, we, we can put aside the myth that, you know, there's no uh, such thing as like a Mac virus or something like that. However, it is an extremely secure platform for one pretty specific reason, and that's just their vertical integration. It's really one of the only platforms out there. Obviously, Microsoft has started to find this uh, foothold for themselves with the Surface platform, but they have the assurance that they're creating an OS that they only have to really account for their own hardware configurations. They're not having to figure out you know, and account for every single possible configuration that's out there, which really that becomes you know, uh, the breeding ground for all these different avenues news and exploits and attack surfaces so they can do things like um, you know putting on things like system integrity protection which really just is basically locking down entire parts of the operating system from the unix standpoint uh, to where you know just by doing that they're reducing the attack surface of the machine they've got a uh, full integration in their hardware so um, they've got things like uh, i think ward can talk a little bit more about this than i can but there's this secure boot process so that all of the components um, of the machine as it's coming online are signed and they're being verified so there's no chance that there's you know some type of uh, external device that's interfering in this process or you know stealing data or anything like that um, and then in terms of like just the things that are natively part of the operating system we talked about xprotect gatekeeper is one that if you're a mac os user you've certainly encountered probably at some point and these are things that are there that do a really good job from like a consumer standpoint of helping you be aware of the threats that are out there to say hey you're about to run something that might harm your computer but Apple being Apple and being very conscious of the user experience and trying to account for like, you know, maybe I'm a security researcher and I want to see what this is going to do to my machine. They're not going to just stop you dead in your tracks. And so there are these ways where you can cancel it. You can on a gatekeeper, you can, you know, right click open and suddenly you've kind of bypassed that feature, which has definitely functionality. But if if you're my employee. I want some extra, you know, ability to stop that because the way that a lot of these threats in Mac OS work is they rely on social engineering. Maybe they'll show a susceptible user like, hey, this thing's going to pop up. Just click cancel. Don't worry about it. And so there are these little workarounds where they can trick users into collaborating with the malware. And so um, without necessarily having to compete, without having to hold back uh, you know, uh, the different security updates that are out there, we felt like there was definitely this window for us to develop a security solution that was native to Mac that wasn't going to compete with these different features and was going to be able to natively extend them. There's a dog barking in the background. Is that uh, picking up on my mic at all? Okay. No worries. Australian Shepherds are the greatest. So, 
uh, the interesting story with this, uh, we call this thing Jam Protect, but the, the cool thing about this is like, we didn't totally develop this on our own. We actually uh, honed in on this really cool startup that was out there. And there were these guys that actually came from the NSA. And these were ex uh, NSA, uh, if there is such a thing, ex NSA <laughs> Mac OS malware researchers. And um, these guys were the experts. Like these, they were, you know, let's say they just knew malware for macOS inside and out. We'll leave it at that. And they knew that there were definitely vulnerabilities in macOS. And so when they left the NSA, they realized that there were ways that they could um, pick up on things that other platforms weren't doing that wasn't going to interfere with the platform where they understood that stuff. So we joined forces with them. And we started to find ways to augment what was there. So like for X-Protect, we're using Apple's native security framework to, uh, for example, like augment literally the list of signatures that's there. X-Protect gets updates every couple of weeks, which is great. But if researchers discovered something yesterday, you don't want to be worrying about, hey, uh, when's that update coming? At the same time, Apple, if they were putting, you know, multiple security updates per day, like that wouldn't work either. So you need to find kind of that middle ground. So we have uh, an agent that's there where every time we're updating the signature database, you know, you're getting a lot of times like multiple updates per day over the air without any work from IT or anything like that. And what's cool is, let's say XProtect blocks something. Uh, and the user tries to override it, we're there and it comes like literally at the same speed as the native piece that's there because we're using the native uh, security framework. So it's as if it's part of the operating system, it's just an extension of. So that's a big piece that we felt was a big ad, like we can block stuff, you know, it's event based, we're not like wastefully scanning stuff because we trust the operating system to do that on its own. And then uh, obviously we can go above and beyond signature based detections too, because obviously there's zero days out there, stuff we don't have signatures for, stuff that's been recently modified. And so this was like really kind of the core piece of the Jam Protect sensor that these guys uh, were developing when we acquired them. Um, is that something that's worth uh, just quickly kind of getting into, like how that works, how we're able to kind of pick yeah. up on stuff beyond signatures? Sure. It's yeah. the best. It's the best part. So Yeah, yeah cool. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, what's interesting is other organizations, if, you know, other security products claim to be able to do this, and they, they have been able to do this, but they've had to use things like kernel extensions to monitor file system events, and really it was a shortcut for them. They didn't really have to necessarily send people to WWDC to learn all the new Apple rules and best practices. They were able to kind of shortcut it just by treating it as like a pure Unix kernel, which it, it is to an extent, and that largely worked, but obviously there are short side uh, stuff that falls through the cracks in that. So what these guys developed was a way to do all this within user space because they understood the platform so well. So uh, using this sensor, they're able to uh, use, there's like a native NS predicate that's part of Mac OS, a predicate logic language where they can uniformly across file system events like downloads, uh, screenshots, you know, like any type of USB writes, um, they're able to just uniformly write these kind of queries that monitor for these different types of suspicious events, call it. You know, maybe you've got an Excel file that's launching, you know, a Python macro that's suddenly editing your DNS record. Like that's, you know, that's not something, we don't need to have a signature for that to, to feel like that's something that's suspicious. So they're able to generate alerts off of all these different things. And the cool thing is the way that they did this to not bog down your whole processor is they, uh, someone had the clever idea of using one of Apple's native frameworks, which is called Gameplay Kit. And Gameplay Kit was actually for game developers and it's like a, a logic engine or a rules based engine. So rather than, okay, if this pixel ever touches this, you know, character, uh, that character dies, they're feeding in these NS predicate rules and it's reading in all these different file system events, looking for these different types of threats based on like, you know, MITRE attack framework and things like that. So what's cool is, you know, when Apple then does subsequent software updates, like they're sitting back, you know, drinking a pina colada because they know that like Apple is doing the hard work for them, like optimizing this thing for the operating system, whereas everyone else is like sweating and figuring like, okay, well, how many how many people need to complain before we uh, throw some serious people at figuring out how to adapt to this thing? So that was a key piece in making this all work. Again, it's just using what's natively there, um, kind of, you know, not to use a security term, but like living off the land in a friendly way. Uh, and uh, consuming fewer resources, making sure that every time there's an, uh, an update from Apple, we're ready to go. We're not going to be the ones holding you back. 
And then on top of that, we can use, uh, Apple has this concept of unified logging. So like all of their, you know, system logs and everything go in essentially through this unified log, but it's all siloed across the individual Macs. We can tap into that. And if you've got Azure Sentinel or Splunk or something like that, you can pick specific types of events that you want to monitor for. So let's say, you know, uh, someone puts in their two weeks and suddenly that you're seeing a lot of airdrop and screenshot events, you know, suddenly you have some forensic record of this to maybe build a case or, you know, maybe use Jamf to automatically have that kick off a, an EFI lock on that machine or something. So, yeah, to, to add to that, one of my favorite features of what everything Matt just went through is that unified logging support that can be filtered into a SIM. Um, the, the, the example I love to give is, you know, if you want to see every time a curl event is happening in your fleet, you want to see every single time someone uses sudo to elevate access in terminal, you you now can granularly see that very, very directly in your sim or even in uh, directly in Jamf Protect. And, uh, you know, it can be very specific to the groups that you're monitoring. You know, obviously, if, uh, you know, uh, a staff member in HR all of a sudden is, is sudoing 14 times a day, there might be something going on there. So, um, you know, it, it just gives you just as you all know, working you know even more directly in the security space, Andy, more specifically. Uh, you know, you without that data, the data is king. You you have to have the data to be able to make action on that data, um, and then you know. There's there's also a remediation and uh, you know being able to tap into the full power of Jamf Pro when you are uh, using Jamf Protect um, gives you the ability to take action then on any of those events you know instantly uh, if if there's you know say it's two in the morning and your CEO's computer is getting synthetic clicks and screenshot events and you know maybe those aren't suspicious but you put the, put it at two in the morning and you you know you put all that together and if it meets the right conditions instantly tell Jamf Protect to send a configuration profile that air gaps the computer MDM locks it and he's got to call someone to fix it um, and while that might be an annoying situation for the CEO um, you all can tell me very well how much an event like that can cost so um, you know it's it, it really ends up being a, a holistic solution that works has worked very well for our customers so far so you know it's interesting so much of kind of what you talked about there uh, Benio sounds similar to a lot of the conversations I have around Microsoft Defender ATP on Windows 10, which is part of the operating system, you know, uses all the native controls and APIs as much as possible. And um, one benefit we often talk about is that it doesn't hold people back from updating because on the Mac, Mac OS updates ship annually. So it's very important to stay up to date on your Mac OS updates on Windows 10. They ship semi-annually. So also very important to stay up to date. And um, it, it's just interesting hearing that conversation and hearing some of the key themes resonate again. Uh, the, the parallels are, are, are really, really interesting. But I just, I, I do appreciate absolutely the Mac is fundamentally a very secure platform. And, and anybody who's worked with it for any length of time would agree with that. Um, but, but certainly there's an opportunity here for somebody to come in and and be that Mac native tool and take advantage of the platform from the beginning. And and I had one question that I'm just kind of curious about because I, I follow this kind of as close as I can, but again, it's not my day job like it is for you guys. So is there, there was, there still is kernel extensions, right? But Apple pretty much doesn't want you to use those anymore. Isn't there something new? Is it like system extensions or something? Can you guys talk about that just at a high level since it kind of came up here? I know it's not completely related, but I'm just curious. Yeah, I can speak to that a little bit. Um, the, the, the yeah, kernel extensions. You know, Ben, you pointed on this a little bit, but uh, at, at, at the core level, uh, the, a kernel extension is a window into the kernel level access of Unix and you know BSD that Mac OS is sitting on top of. So you know, just like a mechanic having access to the cylinders on your car, if there's the chance for something to grab into that kernel core of the system and start messing around and, and doing certain events um, you know sometimes it's fine and they're very good actors and, and you know they're very respectful of that process but this is a system that has just been ripe for exploitation because of the direct you know right to the metal uh, 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 means of it um, but also just for instability you know like i think ben you mentioned that also like you know do, uh, lots of kernel extensions just you know you, you've seen the the kernel extension crash um uh, well, we don't see it very much anymore because kernel extensions are, are kind of going the way of the dodo and in and in 1015 like adam said um they they kind of announced uh with catalina that kernel extensions will be depreciated fully at some point in the future they were actually supposed to do that uh with with big Sur, but they um uh 
didn't haven't fully you know made them impossible to use but if you've read any of the articles on what some of the software that still does have an actual kernel extension what the process is uh, on an M1 Mac specifically to get that enabled you will never want to enable that again I mean we're talking like a 14 page like guide of having to reboot the system like four times boot into secure boot mode undo the security of the signing of the OS which is not good uh, and then allow the kernel extension for your software uh, and I'm looking at you most MV uh, uh, VPN and security vendors, uh, allowing them to still do the way, do, to perform their actions the way they used to, instead of putting the resources in and operating in the current model that we've been speaking about. Um, so the the uh, the user space extensions what is is the replacement for that um, I personally don't have a lot of experience with how that technology works because quite frankly um, there's not really many vendors using it yet um, Microsoft is one of them uh, that is in preview right now uh, but uh, yeah the, it's it's something I can't speak to specifically but I know it's pretty cutting-edge technology and um, it's it's you know, there's still there's there's ways around the kernel extension uh, usage right now, but I, I would say, I mean, we, we don't know what Apple's going to do, but it, the writing's on the wall of how hard they make it to use actual mm -hmm. kernel extensions. Yeah, it's a yellow I, light. I would expect, uh, and that's kind of the thing with Apple, right? A lot of times they don't tell you specifically when they're going to do things, um, but when they tell you they sh you should start developing your iOS apps to uh, support multiple screen sizes, you should probably listen, huh? Um, so same thing. Well, that that's I think that's a, a one of our you know we're getting close to wrapping up here, but but a point I would definitely leave people with, and I'm sure Matt and Matthew, you guys will scream this from the mountaintops. In the Windows world, you can get away with kind of zigging when Microsoft zags. We might tell you to do something, and people will go, yeah, uh huh, that's great. I'm still going to do my own thing. On Apple, you don't want to do that. When Apple, and, and sometimes they will be very clear, and sometimes they will telegraph their moves. And so there, there's a little bit of an experience where if you've been a long-time Apple follower, like I, I have been, you kind of learn, like, even though they didn't say this, they're, they're, they're kind of between the lines, like, you don't want to do that anymore. And it's really, really important if you as a security professional, as an endpoint management professional, whatever you're doing, when Apple speaks, you listen, or you're going to have a bad time. To, to your point, Adam, in one of the uh, show notes, we'll link to that uh, WWC uh, session where they talk a lot about the local account discussion. In that discussion, um, they very specifically, Mike Boylan, he's a, he's an excellent CE at Apple, uh, very specifically talks that, you know, local accounts, or I'm sorry, mobile accounts and binding does still exist for some very specific use cases, but Apple recommends local accounts. And he very specifically uses the phrases, and we have not depreciated that functionality yet. But blah, 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 blah. And I mean, if you can't read that as a professional and actually take action on what is coming with that, um, you maybe are in the wrong profession. So, um, yeah, I think it's very smart to just, you know, listen to what the, the vendors are saying. Um, I'm sure Microsoft would love if their customers would listen uh, <laughs> to, to, to your guidance. Um, so and, and it's been great to see Microsoft uh you know, put that carrot out in front a little bit, making the, the modern solution so much of a better experience that it's kind of obvious. It's like, you really want to be using Configuration Manager uh, and, and Active Directory? Come on, like, no, you don't. Um, you, you just, you just don't, it's all you know. So um, the opportunity's there. Uh, and I think to, at Microsoft and Apple are, are uh, together leading the way on that front, so. My final point here is I, I really like, Benio, how you so eloquently wrapped up the endpoint paradigm where a lot of times a new update comes out and you can't update because your endpoint solution has not uh, is not compatible with the next version and so um and then i've also talked about on the show where a lot of these endpoint vendors are tying in so heavily into the operating systems that it's almost like they're man in the middling your own system. And in light of all of the uh, supply chain attacks that we've had recently, if your endpoint solution becomes compromised, they have all these escalated privileges into the system. And in fact, there's been examples where vendors, uh, endpoint uh, solution vendors have actually used an exploit 
to accomplish what they're trying to do. And then Microsoft comes along and updates that exploit and all of a sudden your endpoint solution breaks, right? And so I really like how what you're talking about here is you're natively trying to do as much as you can within the Apple API and what they um, provide you because you're not really trying to break the system and gain extra insight. Instead, you're trying to work around the system and work with Apple so that when it updates, it, it doesn't uh, break anything. So you're not creating really additional like attack surface. You know, you're not normally normally endpoint protection platforms. They are additional attack surface. They're extremely attractive because they have all these escalated privileges. And when you kind of live within the confines of, of where they want you, you have not added all these additional holes and back doors into Mac OS, which is a good place to be. Where I I've I've suspected in the past when you know, let's go back eight years ago when there was probably a very limited amount of, of malware on the Mac OS platform. It's, it's grown over time. Um, what did some of those vendors do? What did the, some of those antivirus platforms do? I think they, they almost potentially caused more, you know, more security gap than they covered. So, you know, that's different today. That calculus is different, but especially when you're providing all this protective benefit without some of the drawback. I agree that Andy, that, that caught my ear too when you talked about like the kernel extensions and everything for sure. I, I, I can tell you anecdotally in my engagements uh, where we're talking about uh, security offerings, that is the number one thing I hear from customers is that their current tools, I'm not going to name names because honestly I don't need to because it's all of them, uh, other than honestly like Microsoft Defender, Jam Protect, and maybe a, one or two others, uh, you know, the, the huge list of names that uh, are really important big names in the security space uh, are still not ready for Big Sur, are still not ready for the M1. And and what a wonderful stance to tell your users that your security product that's supposed to keep your computer secure, you can't update your OS to the most secure current version because of their software. Um, I'll tell you right now, uh, a word to the wise to those vendors, that's the quickest way to land them in our lap. So, um, <laughs> you know, th thank, you, thank you, but uh, I'd rather see you do it correctly. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah. Well, this has been a great conversation, Matthew, Matt. Thank you so much for taking time and you know coming on our show and talking to us about Mac management. I know I've learned quite a bit, and I'm sure our listeners have as well. This is a great conversation to have, really informative. Um, this is our show for this week. We'll put all of these notes in our show notes for you to follow up if you have additional questions as well as the contact information for Matthew and Matt. Adam and myself will put our contact info as usual. If you have any follow-up questions about the show or have security topics you want us to talk about, please contact us. Thanks and we'll talk to you guys next week. Thanks for having us. Thank you for listening to the Blue Security Podcast. Please check out the show notes, catch up on episodes you may have missed, and subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Find Andy on Twitter at AJawZero and Adam at AJ Brewer. See you at our next episode.